Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Royal Geographical Society for the Cresting Project Final Conference, looking at the sustainability implications of a social transformation to a circular economy. I will start with the housekeeping uh, announcements. For those of you who have been able to get to London today, there are no planned fire alarms. If you hear a very loud noise, head for the exit. On your way, you may pass the women's toilets on the right and the gents on the left. And an announcement for everyone, the sessions will be recorded and will be available later on the Cresting YouTube channel. So, uh, for now, I am delighted to introduce the Chancellor of the University of Hull, the Right Honourable Baroness Bottomley of Nettleston, who's going to officially open the conference. Uh, the Baroness was elected to Parliament in 1984 and held ministerial positions under both John Major and Margaret Thatcher, notably as Minister for Health in 1992 to 1995. Uh, she stood down from Parliament at 2005 and was appointed to the House of Lords. And I think shortly after that became the Chancellor of the University of Hull's been a um, very strong supporter of the city and the university since then is now also, I believe, the Sheriff of Hull. So, Baroness, over to you for your comments. Thank you very much. Well, good morning to you all, wherever you are. We are in the beautiful Royal Geographical Society in the wonderful lecture hall. We've been warmly welcomed by the uh, director, Professor Joe Smith, and we wish you were all with us, but you are with us, with us in spirit, even if not in person. I'm absolutely delighted to be invited to welcome you to this conference on the circular economy, the sustainability implications of a social transformation. And it's good to meet some in person. Pity more couldn't make it, but I say, I'm so delighted that you were able to participate. And of course, there are advantages to participating remotely, the avoidance of carbon emissions, more economic, I suppose. Um, we've all learned to live with that, haven't we? I've been asked to welcome you, as the wonderful Professor Pauline Deutz said, as Chancellor of the University of Hull. And I'm proud to be associated with the Hull University for the past 16 years. And how pleased I am to be able to participate in this international research project. So when uh, Professor Deutz was reading out what I call my obituary, she mentioned that I used to be a member of parliament, and indeed, I was involved with Margaret Thatcher in the first environment conference, saving the ozone layer. And uh, this was when the British scientists, which I'm afraid Mrs. Thatcher minded about a lot, that they were British scientists for the British Antarctic Survey, had discovered the hole in the ozone layer. She'd had, you know, she'd sorted out uh, the Falklands and she'd sorted out the unions, and then she was going to sort of declare war on the environment. And with her own inimitable style, we all gathered together at Westminster and had a really important and influential international conference. So to go to COP26, representing in part the university, it was an echo back of how far, uh, how far life has moved and how much collaboration there is and how much involvement there is. And I know we all would have wished for more, but the fact is that before the latest COP processes, about 30% of the world countries were involved in the system. By the end of it, it's 95%. And of course, we all want more, we all want to go further but it was very exciting. And I wanted to reinforce for a largely academic audience why universities and research institutes are so important. Universities and research institutes are part of the social fabric of our society, the values, the ethos, the searching after truth. And of course, when it comes to the environment in all its regards, we must be evidence-based, and this, of course, is your, absolutely your work with the circular economy. But, you know, research provides evidence of the impact of, of climate changes. It provides the solutions. It provides education and training to the next generation. And experts inform policy and advise governments, which is just critically important. The circular economy may be a recent term, but I'm sure all of you know better than me, one that has taken hold in policy and industry circles in an astonishingly rapid way over the past few years. 
by making our possessions last a little longer, repairing things instead of replacing, being careful to recycle appropriate when they're no longer usable, we can serve both resources and energy. And you couldn't have a better advocate than myself. My Christmas presents to my grandchildren are always recycled bicycles from the local tip. I accept my uh, own daughter's jumble because they've always got something there that I can use. And I become even more of a fanatic. I'm afraid I'm one of those people who irons last year's Christmas wrapping paper. And I now cut up my Christmas cards and send them as postcards. So I am a fanatic. And at one stage, I was buying my clothes when I was in the cabinet from a charity shop. And there was a very funny cartoon with the then Prime Minister John Major and saying, I'm not sure, Mrs. Bottomley, whether it helps you buying all your clothes from a jumble sale if you're trying to be a cabinet minister. But I thought they were very good clothes from the jumble sale. Now, personal behavior, individual action, individual commitment, of course, is really important. But what about the role of government, of business, of other stakeholders, NGOs, charities, all involved in changing the way people think and behave? How are products designed, the infrastructure for collecting them? And one of the benefits of resource conservation managers is that there will be less carbon emissions. Although, as we'll hear, the most environmentally friendly option can be surprising. There's no doubt that we need to find all the possible ways of lowering carbon emissions back to the evidence base. One of the problems for anybody who's been in a parliament anywhere in the world, there are always politicians who think they know better than the scientists. But I'm a great believer in listening to not only the physical scientists, but also the behavioral and social scientists. What is the evidence? I talked about the exciting time at COP, where I could hear first-hand stories of the difficulties people face around the world, the challenges. It's very powerful to hear from people and appreciate the human scale of impact. I spoke with the mayor of Freetown, Sierra Leone, and many others on, on my panels. And some of you will have experienced first-hand extreme weather events of the last year. The heat wave in Canada, 40 degrees centigrade heat for five days, contributing to the deaths of 500 people, potentially a billion marine animals. Accompanying wildfires have destroyed vegetation that might have reduced the effects of heavy rainfall, leaving 18,000 people now stranded by floods. All the flooding in Germany, the rainfall increased by an estimated 20% in response to climate change, with almost 10 centimeters of rain falling in 24 hours. 170 people died. Indonesia, more than 150 killed by the impact of a storm in April. We heard only this week the record high temperature in the southern Antarctic, up to 18.3 degrees centigrade. The last record was 17.5. All around us is the evidence of what's happening and the threat, the danger, and the imperative that we should all act. And unfortunately, the changes to the Earth's climate don't appear to be working in anyone's favor. With less predictable weather patterns, more extreme events, reduced agricultural land, which in some cases is already causing extreme distress and hardship. It's also the case that inequalities are being increased. Poorer countries with less capacity for adaptation are suffering more pronounced effects than the richer countries, countries whose industrial outputs over the last 150 years or more have in large part caused the problem. And with this, we're going to see growing migration, growing vulnerable populations, moving from country to country, looking for somewhere where they can have a home and a livelihood. At Hull, we're very, also very involved in modern slavery. And that's so much part of this story. And of course, this raises the issue of sustainable development. This first arose in the 1980s, when as I was say I was an environment minister a strategy for international fairness in response to environmental concerns of the time. It was defined by the World Commission on Economic Development in the 80s as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Sustainable development is commonly seen as requiring the balancing of three concerns for the environment, so the environment, society, and the economy. And of course, it proves elusive. There are trade-offs. There are different vested interests. When environment, society, and the economy are all aligned, then the answer is pretty straightforward. But when they're, in, uh, di when they're divergent views, then it's much more difficult. 
There have been extraordinary levels of development in some parts of the world, such as China and India, but economic development has been accompanied by high levels of pollution and carbon emissions on the one hand, while poverty remains uh, entrenched internationally, really appalling in our land and our world of wealth the degree of poverty that still exists. And some measures has even increased uh, since the 80s. Now, whilst it's easy to say that we want development to be sustainable, how in practice to achieve economic growth need needed for poorer countries to catch up while protecting the environment and having socially fair outcomes? You'll know that the uh, negotiations at COP26 were ultimately held up at the end by different interests and different options for countries according to their state of develop development. And you all saw how the president of COP, Alok Sharma, worked so hard and was evidently so distressed not to achieve the goal he was really reaching for. But my goodness, as I said earlier, he made great strides along the road. The circular economy is argued to be a route to sustainable development. For example, as part of the EU's Green Deal, Green Deal for post-pandemic recovery, also part of the UK government's industrial and environmental plans. The goal is to separate economic development from resource use, reduce carbon emissions, and leave no place or person behind. Waste management still accounts for 3% of EU greenhouse gases, despite an impressive reduction of over 40% since 95. And this, besides the emissions, there is complete futility of disposing of materials that can still be used. People are investing in the recovery of metals from landfill, but how much better not to throw them away in the first place? So over the last five years, there's been a huge surge of research into the circular economy. Over 11,000 academic papers during the lifetime of this project. And I warmly congratulate you in all your different countries with your different experience and contexts and settings. And I'm sure that the conclusions of this conference will be illuminating, enlightening, and point the way forward. Many are proposing technological or organizational developments that are expected to promote the recovery of resources or improve the design of products. The exciting thing about the Cresting project is that it's not only investigating ways to promote the development of a circular economy, but also examining the impacts. Are circular initiatives necessarily environmentally friendly? Who's benefiting from the changes? We have to have a cool head as well as a warm heart. Can we say that no place or people are left behind? How far have we progressed so far? So, uh, panel members, moderators, Alfredo, who is running the control room, who I think is probably the most important person here to keep everybody on track, I wish you a fascinating conference. There are no spectators in this environmental challenge. We're all participants. David Attenborough, only the other day, was saying, if we don't seize these opportunities, we will be as roundly condemned as all those who colluded with slavery two centuries ago. It's for us to act, and how impressed I am with the work, the intellect, and the endeavor already set in progress. Warmest congratulations to the most distinguished Professor Pauline Deutz, who's been a real tower of strength at the University of Hull. I wish you well, and I look forward to reading your conclusions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Baroness Bottomley, for your very kind words. Uh, I would now uh, like to introduce Professor Susan Lee, who is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Hull. And she started her career as a lecturer in psychology at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, before moving to the University of Plymouth in 1994. Since then, she has held senior positions in Plymouth, later at King's College in London, and at the University of Greenwich before joining the University of Hull as our Vice Chancellor in 2016. Thank you very much, Professor Lee. Thank you, and good morning, everybody. Uh, what a delight it is to be able to participate in this very important conference as the University of Hull's Vice Chancellor. While I'm sorry not to be able to join you in person, I have at least been able to avoid carbon emissions by presenting to you remotely. The University of Hull's 2030 strategy has the critical and connected issues of environmental sustainability and social justice as core themes. 
They permeate who we are and, of course, are a focus of our research at the University of Hull. We are working across disciplines and collectively with partners and industry to seek sustainable solutions for the future of our planet and its people. From developing low carbon heating technologies to advancing wave energy research, from driving skills and innovation in the offshore wind sector to initiatives helping communities to mitigate risks from flooding from projects transforming the bioeconomy of our region to research on building a circular plastic economy. Of course, collaboration is vital to solving the serious problems of the world today. It is through collaboration that innovation and creativity flourish. Whilst wicked problems like climate change are global, so too is the world's economy and applying international expertise to deliver place-based solutions is essential. The Cresting project includes international partners from universities, companies and public bodies in Austria, France, Italy, the Netherlands and Portugal, China, Nigeria, Taiwan and Germany. It benefits from bringing together not just a wide range of expertise, but the added richness afforded by different geographical and cultural perspectives. The Cresting Project has also offered the opportunity to involve the City of Hull with Hull City Council engaged as one of the project partners. Indeed, Hull has been the focus of three of the Cresting Projects that you will hear about this afternoon. And so I thought it was worth saying just a little bit about our city. The Humber within which Hull sits has the highest CO2 emissions of any region in the UK. Moreover, its geography means that it would be one of the first areas to experience the impact of rising sea levels. Yet, Hull and the Humber region are leading the way in the transition to a zero carbon economy. Its researchers, industry, public sectors, SMEs and communities are united in viewing these challenges as our greatest opportunity. The opportunity for the region to serve as a living lab a trailblazer for decarbonisation and clean energy technology. The opportunity to use our geography to our advantage as the perfect location for driving growth of the UK's offshore wind energy sector and innovating new models of flood resilience. The opportunity to demonstrate that if the creation of a zero carbon economy can be achieved here, it can be achieved anywhere. Similarly, by learning about how a circular economy might be taking shape in a city like Hull and what challenges and opportunities exist for its further development, we can learn more about both the nature of a circular economy and how this might be developed in similar places around the world. So though the Cresting project has examined places like Hull in depth, the project's relevance is much wider, extending to European and international scales. But if we are truly to tackle the climate crisis, sustainability alone is insufficient. As Baroness Bottomley has said, climate change is as much an issue of social injustice as it is an environmental threat. The transition to a zero carbon economy must be fair and inclusive if we are to avoid leaving behind those areas most likely to suffer the impacts of climate change. And globally, it is often these same areas that are least likely to contribute to the causes of climate change and least able to mitigate and adapt to its effects. Indeed, the major role of the city of Hull and the Humber region have played in the UK's industrial and maritime history is a source of both the region's decarbonisation challenge and some of the most significant social inequalities in the country including nationally high levels of unemployment and low levels of education. So Hull is not just at the forefront of green innovation. Its mission is to be a showcase for a model of fair and sustainable social and economic regeneration. The city and the wider Humber region are examples of the sorts of places that will benefit hugely from a circular economy, not just for environmental reasons, but as part of a social transformation. A circular economy that brings new skills and new jobs, sustainable and affordable products, and a new outlook as we all learn 
to be more efficient and more mindful of our own personal impact on the planet. I know that we are keen to hear more and the day promises illuminating presentations and interesting discussions. And so I'll now ask the esteemed Professor Pauline Deutz to introduce the formal proceedings. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much, Professor Lee, for your introduction and kind words. So I will proceed to tell you a little bit about the project. Thank you. <laughs> the slide, this is sort of advanced warning for what's coming through the day. Alfredo and his team are controlling the slides up in the mission control there. So I'm not there yet, but when I say next in a moment, there will be time to move on. No, I said I wasn't there yet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I would just like to tell you a little bit about the background to project, the type of project, and the structure of the way it uh, has been organized. Uh, the Questin project has been funded by the European Commission under the Horizon 2020 program. Uh, uh, we are partnered here for this event with the Royal Geographical Society, with the Institution of British Geographers. So this is the Academic Association for Geographers in the UK, but it's much more than that. It has an international membership and indeed a sort of public membership as well. If you want to visit the beautiful building, the conference is generally here, uh, end of August each year. The other organization that we're partnered with is the International Sustainable Development Research Society, which is approaching its 28th annual conference this year online, and we hope in Stockholm as well. It's through ISDRS that the network for this project uh, was formed, and we'd be delighted to see as many of you as possible joining us in Stockholm to continue the discussion around the circular economy. Next slide, please. So our project, the type of project that uh, we have as Cresting is a Marie Skrodowska Curie Innovative Training Network. Uh, the training part of this is quite important. Uh, the bulk of the work, as you will see, was done by the 15 early stage researchers or ESRs that we recruited who are doing PhDs throughout the various universities uh, involved. Uh, there's also a team of supervisors we'll see shortly. We've had partner organizations from outside of academia and our advisory board who have been uh, supporting us. Uh, you see us here at our first workshop, which was in Hull in uh, 2018. We've had five more, uh, the last two online, where we've been looking at uh, how one might research and understand more about the circular economy and exchanging ideas uh, with each other. The next slide, please. So this is the supervisory team. Uh, you'll be seeing the, the ESRs presenting their work as we go through the day, but most of the supervisory team uh, are in the background. You'll see the work package leaders introducing the relative section. So I just wanted to show uh, everyone at this moment. Each ESR has had a team of two or three supervisors representing at least two different countries and two different disciplines to take a broad approach uh, to what we're studying, which has also meant that we were pretty well adapt to online meetings before they uh, became a necessity. And the next slide, please. So besides the sort of academic team, I would like to mention our project manager, Claire Lee, who many of you will have been in touch with, who's been putting together this now rather complicated uh, hybrid conference. So thank you very much, Claire. I would also like to thank our advisory board, who is of academic industry and policy focused, who've been providing some sort of guidance and oversight to keep us on track through the project. Very important also the partners to the project who have an official role in this type of project. They have provided secondments for the ESRs to give them a chance to spend time in organizations that are either directly trying to develop the circular economy or trying to perhaps advise companies or other bodies to do so. Uh, you can see we've got a wide range of type of organizations here. Uh, national, regional, local government, various types of companies who are manufacturing, advising, software, waste 
companies, advisory bodies, and also uh, NGOs. Uh, so we're very grateful to the partners for their support throughout the project, as well as the comments. They've provided data in some cases, or they've agreed to be interviewed. They've taken part in workshops, or they've distributed surveys. Uh, they've been very fundamental to the research that we've done. So thank you very much. And the next slide, please. Now we come perhaps to the crux of the day, and you might think that we would have worked this out some years ago, but we have to ask, what is a circular economy? It's rather an evolving concept. There are many different uh, definitions and approaches to what a circular economy is, or perhaps could be. I promise I'm not going through all of them. I've picked out two as kind of examples. So this is the European Commission definition, 2015. So this was the understanding of the circular economy that's kind of enshrined in policy when we started the project. Notice how the focus is on uh, resource efficiencies. It's making materials and products last as long as possible and reducing the amount of waste. And you can use various ways of doing that, as uh, the Chancellor mentioned earlier as well, from this uh, hierarchy, the R strategies, uh, as they're called, to promote resource efficiencies. But perhaps the circular economy can be more than this. If we move to the next slide, please. Could it be a sustainability transformation? Well, there are, as I say, several definitions I could have chosen. I've taken this one from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation from a couple of years ago. Now, underlined the key point here, the positive society-wide benefits. So there's a reference to economic, social, and environmental benefits from the circular economy in this definition. So we could see it as a recipe for sustainable development. But this is very much an aspiration. I think no one would argue that this sort of definition has been fulfilled already. It's something that we might want to aim towards. But the key ideas behind this particular project was to stop and think and assess how far have we got already towards a developing a circular economy. Are we moving in a direction that we might see as being socially beneficial? It would be an unusual situation indeed if the benefits were socially, you know, widely or totally distributed, let's say, through society. And remembering that we're in the Royal Geographical Society, important to this project has been the idea of how the benefits might be distributed geographically as well. So I uh, so of key idea is to understand what type of transformation are we perhaps heading towards via a circular economy. So the next slide, please. These are the questions that we've been addressing and that you'll hear about in the two sessions, the morning one, uh, from three of the work packages, organizations and a circular economy. So what is the current practices in the public and private sector? By what sort of means could those organizations become more circular? And how can we assess whether the progress that they're making is indeed in a direction that we might consider to be sustainable? Uh, and in the afternoon, the other two work packages will be discussing how places and policies interact with a circular economy. And the next place, just to give you some idea how this will work, I will shortly hand over to the team who are distributed across Europe, who will talk us through the findings relating to the organizations and the circular economy. There may be time for a few quick questions and answers for clarification when they have finished, we will see. After that, we have a break. After the break, we hand over to our first expert panel. So each member of the panel will have a chance to present their perspective and their response to the Cresting project and ask us questions. There should also be time for questions that you may be typing into the chat uh, as we go along. Then we'll pause for lunch and repeat the same sort of setup in the afternoon for the uh, other question that we're asking. So that is it from me for now. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to hand over to Professor Thomas Ramos, who is leader of Work Package 3, and he is going to be introducing the first session. Thank you.